We have today our keynote speech and uh, afterwards the panel discussion. And uh, it's my pleasure to announce to you the keynote speaker of today, Professor Ming Feng Ling, who came all the way from uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, I think it's a 14 hour flight, so we really appreciate the effort of, of flying over to, to Berlin. I thought we, we make it more appreciatable uh, since tomorrow is the 30th anniversary of the German reunification, so you can actually do two things, uh, come to the conference and also uh, attend this very historic um, event. So Ming Feng uh, is an associate professor at the Georgetown Institute of Technology. He is at the business school and the department of management information systems. He did his PhD in uh, business and management from the University of Maryland. Uh, at the University of Maryland he also earned his uh, MA in economics, um, but he also earned another MA in economics from uh, Peking University, where he also received his uh, BA. He has a lot of uh, fellowships uh, at different uh, universities. Uh, I just named one of the most important. So he's also a fellow at uh, Cambridge University, where he's at uh, Judge Business School and the Center for Alternative uh, Finance. And uh, Ming Feng was one of the first uh, scholars I, I have to say I found uh, publishing in the area of peer to peer lending and uh, crowd investing and crowdfunding in general. In particular, in uh, 2013, you had your first paper on management science already on peer to peer lending. And uh, so that was really the, the start of the, of the literature, I would say. And uh, since then, you didn't stop. So I, I just counting your iterating in your publications. It's either management science, you have five by now and uh, for information system research. And uh, there are a couple of them already in the pipeline. Again, I would say if I have to make a prediction, it's probably the next one is information system research because now it's then it's five to five, I would say. And um, so uh, your honors and awards list is very, very impressive. So in total, I counted uh, 33 awards and honors. And uh, so I cannot name all of them. Uh, just uh, I would suggest to you to, to see the website of Ming Feng and then you, you will be very impressed. So among others, he received the best paper award of management science. Also for management science, he became the distinguished service uh, or got the distinguished service award. And uh, I must say there are a lot of productive people here in this room and uh, I, I really appreciate that, that uh, loss is among uh, one of them, I would say. And, but Ming Feng is really topping, topping the edge, I would say. So he's really one of the most uh, productive people I know. Today, uh, he actually talks very much on the topic or the overall theme of our conference because his uh, presentation or his keynote speech today will be about something borrowed, something new from peer to peer lending to real estate crowdfunding and beyond. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your presentation and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming to Berlin. Thank you so much, Lars, for the uh, very nice introduction and also for the honor to be here to share my work with you guys. And uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, so as Lars mentioned, I've been working on peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending uh, for quite a while. Uh, never counted, actually, um, it's almost like 12 years now since when I was a student. Uh, at that time, um, it was quite uncertain how far it's going to go. And uh, I'm going to share my personal story in that period. But if you guys know, like today, it has become, since the time I was a student, it has become a global phenomenon uh, from the US, China, and then uh, UK, Germany, and many other places as well around the world. Uh, so it has, it has produced many, many great success stories, but also produced some horror stories. Uh, so, like, so that's why this, the Chinese government cracked down on uh, P2P lending a few years ago. So, but back then, uh, it was just started. So this was the homepage of Prosper when I was starting my uh, PhD dissertation. It looks very dated, as it should be, because that was back in 2006 when they uh, just started. So for me at that time, because uh, uh, I came from an econ background, so we are always looking for data. And uh, this one seems to be a very promising kind of uh, arena. So that's why, and also it seems really exciting. I just got, got really excited by the phenomenon itself. Uh, so I collected the data, started processing it, and then tried to formulate research questions based on that data set. But at that time, it was actually not all peachy. So in fact, I was quite stressed out, to be honest, for two reasons. One is, Prosper itself, at that time, it was just starting. So there was a lot of uh, good news coming out from day to day, but sometimes there also bad news. Like uh, November 24th, 2008, SEC, the Security uh, Exchange Commission in the US, sent a cease and desist letter to 
Prosper to make sure that it want them to shut down. So that I, I saw the news and then my heart almost stopped. <laughs> so uh, and then like two days later, they got sued by a class action lawsuit um, by the investors, probably following the cease and desist letter. And then they also run into some um, troubles along the way, especially their ups and downs in the fundraising process. So. Um, at that time, it was a startup, and uh, I tried to comfort myself, say that, hey, even if it goes out of business, it's still real money invested by real people on the real marketplace. So even if it goes out of business, this is still a good place that generates great data that we can uh, study as researchers. So that's one thing that's kind of tried to comfort myself, uh, try to encourage me myself to keep working on my dissertation. Uh, but there's another source of stress, which is the fact that it's public data. Uh, so because everybody is looking at that. I think there are many other uh, people like in the finance, in the, uh, finance uh, area, also marketing area, they're also looking at the same data set. So as a student with not much resources to myself, that was always a stress. I, the, my biggest fear is that, because actually that was the time I was about to go on the job market, and my biggest fear or nightmare would be that wake up, I wake, wake up Sunday and some people publish or submitted something on exactly the same idea as I was having. So fortunately that didn't happen. <laughs> so, but. I always try to uh, convince myself that after all these papers, the, the first two papers I was having in my dissertation, I should get out of this data set. Uh, so, but after all these years, Prosper has changed a lot. Okay, so they have gone through many, many uh, ups and downs as well. But for myself, I often somehow just keep coming back to Prosper data set. Uh, this is, uh, so for several reasons, I always find myself coming back to the uh, same data set I've been working on. So even today, like uh, a few weeks ago, I have met a friend of mine who was a student in Maryland. Uh, we haven't met each other for 10 years, I think. And then he asked me, what are you working on today? I said, I'm still working on Prosper data, in addition to other data sets. <laughs> so, uh, but there are several good reasons for this. They are always coming back to Prosper uh, data for several reasons. One is the fact that the data is extremely rich. Um, there are two reasons for this. One is that it is from a debt-based or loan-based crowdfunding uh, context and as loans. Uh, as you know, it's a heavily regulated industry and also it's a very data rich industry. So you have a lot of information about the borrower and so on. So even from the traditional bank, you have that information. Um, but here it's actually not just that, the nature of the context, but also the fact that Prosper made the data publicly available for a long time. So from 2006 until 2013, they made uh, the daily snapshot of all the entire platform publicly available. So that was essentially the data source that I have been using. Uh, so I was using the data set uh, for many, many papers. So this is just a ER diagram. So it's, it's not, not just they, they didn't just provide the data for anybody to look through. They actually provide great documentation, which was a really uh, fantastic way for us as students at that time. And uh, so even though I have newer data, I think in many ways this is still very, very unique and very, very helpful in many ways. Okay. And uh, there are other reasons. The other one is that because it's a loan-based crowdfunding, uh, it's a loan with a fixed uh, maturity date. So for us, we feel like there's a, the, one of the biggest benefits is as a very objective measure for quality. So for whether you are, uh, especially if you are a lender, if you're trying to decide who to invest, invest in, uh, for loans, you have a very specific date at which you can look back and say whether you made a good judgment or not. So if you invest in somebody, if you lend money to that person, three years down the road, you know for sure whether that was a good investment or not once, once the loan uh, matures, whether defaults or paid back. Okay, so that was the objective for quality. Uh, so if you look at rewards crowdfunding, debt-based crowdfunding, uh, I have some of those data sets as well, but that's always been a struggle, how to define the underlying, the quality of that campaign. So for loans, this is much less controversial. So you can actually just look at that and then you can calculate not just whether it's repaid, you can also look at, uh, for instance, the return of investment for investor's point of view. Okay, so that's really the, the, the nature of that data that makes it um, much amenable to answer a lot of the research questions, especially from economist's point of view, when we're trying to answer information asymmetry issues. Um, the, second, the third one is the fixed time horizon. So for equity crowdfunding, which is great for businesses, it goes on, could go on theoretically forever, but for loans, it's a fixed date, right? So by that date, you can actually make a determination. And then the last one is, actually not the least, is the rich history that Prosper has gone through. So I, have, I often found myself uh, using this a lot because I've been using the data set for so long. Uh, I think I know quite a few things that people probably wouldn't notice if you're not working on the data set. Uh, so Prosper has gone through a lot of changes in their policy. Uh, so many of the work that I do actually uses the natural experiments, either policy changes from Prosper or like the SEC shutdown of Prosper, I also use that as a natural experiment to help me tease out the causal influence in the data. So that has always been a valuable thing in the publication process. I think, is, as you guys would know, it's kind of difficult if you don't have a clear identification reviewer. It's pretty tough on that. So 
so the um, so these are the reasons that I keep finding myself going back to prosper data. Uh, so these are the uh, uh, some studies have been working on so far using this data set. And uh, I, the reason I wanted to bring them up today is that I think even though the research are done on the prosper data set, which is on the peer-to-peer -peer lending or debt-based crowdfunding, I think at least to some extent, some of the findings could be useful in informing uh, the decisions in the other crowdfunding markets, such as equity crowdfunding, rewards crowdfunding, or even real estate crowdfunding, and even future innovations in this field. So uh, this will be uh, some of the things I want to talk about today, I'm trying to summarize my research has, that has been done so far. Uh, so some of them are, have been published, some of them are still ongoing, and uh, so I think there are still some things that we can, uh, uh, we can work on from the data set, and I hope that uh, the conclusion uh, that I drew from those places can also be useful in uh, in 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 the in other uh, contexts. So, actually, some of these questions, like the last one here on the secondary market, we actually when we started out, we were trying to answer that question in the equity crowdfunding market. And uh, but when I talked to my co-authors, actually we we decided that actually it's better to answer that question uh, because of the nature natural experiment that we experienced. So that's why we actually come back to use the prosper data. Uh, so. I classify my work in this area into three broadly, uh, broadly defined areas. One is the primary market design, meaning that the features of the primary market where the borrowers and lenders interact with each other. So essentially we're trying to understand the features that platforms roll out to um, try to solve the uh, asymmetric information problem between borrowers and lenders. So this is different uh, features that the platform has and we're trying to understand and whether they have influence in mitigating that issue, trying to make the market work. Okay, so that's the, the, the one thing. So for instance, the first one, which um, the things that with the underlying are the ones I want to spend a little bit more time on. Um, the first one is the market mechanism. Uh, so that's, that's how the market uh, is actually organized. So for any platform, that's probably the first question. How would you decide uh, how the borrowers and lenders, or even in equity crowdfunding, how the investors and entrepreneurs should be matched to each other? So that's the market, market uh, mechanism that I was referring to. Uh, the second part is the individual uh, difference between investors. So for that one, um, this is essentially the heterogeneity of my investors. So we also look at institutional investors versus noise traders, and then also some other information, uh, some other angles such as local investors and information about bids. And then the last one is the secondary market. Uh, so, uh, so this is some of the uh, studies that we've done so far. Each one of the bullet points can probably expand into a whole hour of talk, which I won't do, I promise. Uh, so I just want to highlight for each one of them, I just, uh, for the three things I underlined, I just want to give a one slide overview, and then so we can talk more. I can go into as much detail as you like me to, okay? Uh, so the first one is the market mechanism. Uh, this is uh, also using Prosper data. And uh, what we did at that time was to use a natural experiment on Prosper when they changed the whole platform's design from an auction uh, format to a posted price format. So in the auction format is that you as investors, when you come to the website, you can look at the auctions and then you can decide which one to bid on. And then uh, there's an auction, auction process, meaning that as funds come in, if it exceeds the amount that the borrower is requesting, the interest rate could potentially go down. So from an economics point of view, it seems like a very good mechanism, right? You can actually reach probably the one with the least regret from both sides. So because you can essentially like a determinant uh, process, auction uh, clearing, you can find the market clearing price for each borrower. Um, but the downside of that obviously is that it takes time for auctions to complete. So that's also one of the reasons that Prosper switched to posted price, in which in that kind of uh, context, in posted prices, Prosper would come up with the, the decision on how much each borrower should be borrowing at. So they actually price the loan uh, for the lenders. And then the lender's decision when they come to the website will be simplified in the sense that you only need to decide whether you want to be part of that loan or not. So you cannot really change the interest rate even if you're willing to provide more than they're asking for. So that's really the idea. Um, so, um, we, so that's the original assignment, uh, the, the, the um, the announcement that they sent out is that they're trying to convince the uh, investors that this is a good thing, uh, which I think is, is true because if you are thinking, of thinking from the platform's point of view, the speed of funding is definitely important, right? Because you make profit when the loans have been funded. Um, but what we found using that natural experiment, because they shut down the, the website, uh, shut down the, the auction-based format and switched it over to posted price, we did a before and after comparison using that as a natural experiment. 
And what we found is that, yes, the funding speed did increase, meaning that it is much faster than before to get the loans funded. Okay? But on the other hand, the default rate is actually getting higher. And what we, uh, how, how we reached that conclusion, of course, empirically, is what we, that's what we found. But theoretically, um, in our model, what we found is the intuition is actually pretty straightforward, meaning that in the past, when the borrower uh, borrow money, they start with their asking interest rate. So they come up with the, the original, for instance, I want to borrow money at $10,000 starting at 25%. So uh, I know that if I give that interest rate too low, I may not get the money, but if I give the interest rate too high, then I'm gonna be stuck with that rate for, for the whole life of the loan. So I will be less likely to give you a very high rate. Okay, so I will be trying to be conservative in, in deciding where the starting point should be for the auction. But for the platform, they know that Lend borrowers will have that kind of a reservation, so they actually take advantage of that because if the price comes from Prosper, the platform is going to carry a much more uh, important or much more impactful impact, uh, effect on, on the investors because they know that it's kind of a platform's decision making. They have all the data about the borrowers, so they should be able to come, be able to come up with an interest rate that is appropriate for that borrower. So uh, because of that, lenders should be able to react more strongly to the uh, price that Prosper gives to a borrower. Okay, so for that reason, Prosper, Prosper as a platform could command that as a premium. They can actually charge a higher interest rate than what the borrower would normally ask for at the beginning if they were to price the loan, loan themselves. So this is also, also what we found in, empirically. So again, the funding rate is higher, but the default rate is also higher. And because of the default rate is higher, the overall return to investment for investors is actually decreasing, at least under some circumstances. And we also did some uh, welfare analysis, uh, looking at the whole social welfare uh, from the platform to the uh, borrowers and lenders. And at least under some uh, circumstances, the default rate will be, de uh, the overall social welfare will be de decreasing as well. So meaning that the overall message that we uh, took away from that uh, exercise is that even though from a platform point of view, it may be better to use a positive price mechanism, it actually comes at a cost that may not be uh, obvious otherwise, meaning that it could come at the cost of a higher uh, likelihood of a default. So that's something that we want to highlight. And this is also highlighting the fact that there are so many stakeholders in the uh, crowdfunding market, no matter what kind of crowdfunding market it is, whoever has the pricing power actually has a lot of impact on the market outcome. So that's, I think that's one thing that we want to uh, take away from that uh, study. Okay. Uh, the second one is um, going back to the three things. Uh, I want to use this one as an illustration for the uh, differences between uh, uh, different kind of different investors. Uh, as you guys know, they are both uh, retail investors who are just like playing around. Uh, we call them the noise traders in the literature, meaning that they don't have a whole lot of asset. They are tend to be more uh, um, risk averse, and then they tend to not react too well in, to the information that's in the market. Um, they are also institutional investors uh, in Prosper. So what they are, we have been working on a few projects trying to understand the relationship between the two and also how they compare to each other. So. I had two studies here. Uh, one of them is the effect of wh when Prosper started labeling institutional investors, uh, meaning that before some investors, some institutional investors could participate, but they are just not labeled as institutions. And after a certain date, they become labeled as institutions. And the bidding history is visible to retail to everybody on the platform. And we found out that after they become, uh, the label was shown to retail investors, the retail investors definitely had a significant reaction to the institutional investors. In other words, the fact that an institution shows up in a loan, that actually carries a very significant impact on retail investors, even though that, that actually ended up to be a, not a very rational kind of decision for them to make. So that was one. And then the other one, which we thought was quite uh, interesting, it was based on a Prosper's uh, mispricing. So which we were just talking about the, the pro, uh, Prosper pricing the loans, um, but there was actually a period of time between December 10th of 2010 and July of 2012 when Prosper had a mispricing, meaning that for people who are very different in terms of their underlying credit risk, they should have very different uh, interest rates, but because of the pricing scheme that they had at that time, they will actually charge the same interest rate. So we use that as a, this is one example. Uh, so the, uh, the interest rate was charged based on a number of factors. One of them is the uh, credit score and so on. Uh, so for instance, this, in this one uh, example, one borrower has a credit score between 640 and 660. Uh, this is the credit score in the U US credit system. So uh, 
uh, we do not know the exact credit score, but we know the range, the 10 point, uh, 20 point range where they are fought into. So we you know that borrower one's credit score is somewhere between 640 and 660. And then borrower two credit score is 760 and 780. So by any kind of indication, the second borrower should be a much less credit risk. So you, when you lend money to them, you should give them a better interest rate, lower interest rate. But during that period of time, they actually, both of them were assigned to C, uh, at least this is actually what we observe in the data. And because they are assigned to the C credit grade in the uh, prosperous um, pricing scheme, they were both charged the same interest rate, which is 21.48%. So that was a very uh, unique period, um, and uh, it actually went on for quite a long time, actually. Uh, so we used that as an opportunity to identify the behavior of institutional investors and retail investors, meaning that when you, face, when you are faced with opportunities to, in a sense, to arbitrage, are you able to take advantage of that opportunity? So what we found is that for loans that were underpriced, uh, you do, uh, you do see, or actually uh, overpriced, meaning that you're charging a higher interest rate, you do see a higher presence of in, uh, institutional investors. So meaning that they are actually able to take advantage of the information much, more be much better than retail investors would. So retail investors, they are actually faced with the same set of information. If they, ha if they even look at the platform, they should know that this is actually a bad idea, meaning that for people uh, in the borrow one case, if you are thinking about these two, you should go with borrow two for sure, right? But actually a lot of uh, retail investors still go with borrow one. So we use that to, as an opportunity to identify, uh, trying to distinguish between the ability of retail investors and inst institutional investors. That's always been a question in the literature, uh, whether smart money is really smart. Okay, so that's, so, so that's essentially the question we're trying to uh, understand. We pay them a lot of money to manage our money, so whether they're actually able to uh, de deliver a better performance. So we, what we found here is that, indeed, institutional investors are able to take advantage of the information. They do invest better. So if you look at their overall return, it's actually higher. But the difference is actually very, very small. So my co-author, Rick Zayas, as a, he's a finance uh, professor in Arizona, he did a very interesting calculation. So it's just like a mental exercise. So if both retail investors and institutional investors uh, start with equal share of the market, and then we know that they have a difference in the performance, how long would it take them uh, for the retail investors to be completely irrelevant, meaning that they, their share of the market would go down to less than 10%. And his calculation is that it takes about 400 years. So meaning that there is a difference, but the, minimum, the difference is actually very, very small. So that was one thing that was kind of uh, interesting. And the, the uniqueness of the data is that this has been a question that's been going on, but we have a very unique opportunity in the, in the data to understand the ability of the retail investors versus the uh, institutional investors. Okay. So, uh, so this is uh, the second part, which I think is um, it's also a very important part for any kind of uh, crowdfunding, especially in equity crowdfunding. You have some people who are really experts, they all know, know a lot, and some people who are, they want to uh, get a share in the future, Facebook and so on, but may, they may not be able to process information uh, that uh, correctly. So the question is to what extent we should protect them. Okay, so actually retail investors, it's actually very interesting in the finance literature. Even though they are retail investors, uh, they are noise traders, meaning that they are almost like acting on noises, they are very sensitive to noises, it, it is actually very essential for the liquidity of the market. So you don't want a market where there are only institutional investors participating. So I think this is kind of a, where it gives us a lot of things to think about uh, to what extent we want to protect them. Uh, uh, so this is actually how, how uh, intel, uh, re institutional investors and retail investors can interact with each other. So this is actually uh, a, has some implications for other uh, crowdfunding formats as well. Okay. The third one, which we were looking at, again, we look at the uh, three parts. One is the primary market design, the second one is the uh, investor heterogeneity, and then the third one is the secondary market. So I think it, this is, I think, another amazing development in the fintech world in the past decade. So in the, in the past, we're trying to figure out how the primary market works, but now we're actually stepping into the secondary market because people want liquidity, right? So, uh, so this one, was really kind of a lucky thing for me because uh, I was just collecting data on Prosper um, back in 2016, I think, for a while. And then they suddenly sent out an announcement because I, I'm an investor on Prosper. So they said that uh, as of, I, I forget the exact date, We're gonna, they, they just sent an email saying that uh, on, on a certain day, I think three months in the future, we're gonna shut down the secondary market uh, So because it has not been used that much. So 
I just kept on collecting the data, and then we're trying to, uh, trying to understand how the shutdown of the secondary market affects the primary market. So it was kind of a lucky thing that was collecting the data before they actually shut down the market. Uh, but at that time, I also knew that this is not a question that uh, uh, folks in my field, I mean in the information systems field, that they will be interested in, because it's a very finance question. But it's very lucky for me that I actually uh, uh, got into collaboration with uh, quite a few finance co-authors, and we actually got this project up and running very quickly. So this one uh, has been, uh, we almost have a working paper ready, so it's a, but this is, uh, what we are trying to do is trying to understand when you shut down the secondary market, in the sense whether there is a secondary market or not, how that affects the primary, primary market's liquidity. So the liquidity in terms of the funding time, how much time it takes for you to fund the loan, the cost of funding, and then the total, loan, total amount that can be funded. So that, those are the typical definition in the finance literature uh, uh, that we use to define liquidity. And uh, what we found is that even though, this is the interesting part to us, I think, at least, uh, even though Prosper, the reason that they shut down the secondary market is that not many people are using it. But what we found is that even though this is a nominally used, minimally used secondary market, the fact that it exists still provides the comfort that investors need to trade in the primary market. So when you shut down the secondary market, even though it was almost nobody was using that, using that, it still has a very significant impact on the liquidity of the primary market. So that was the, the main finding. And again, I think it's pure luck that actually I came, came right into that natural experiment. So we studied how investors react to the announcement and then the actual shutdown of the market. Okay. So, um, so I think secondary market is always uh, a very interesting thing. I think especially for loans, right? Because many of the loans are three years in land or five years in land. So what if something happens to the investor? They want that liquidity. And the same thing for uh, equity and also other kinds of crowdfunding, especially like real estate crowdfunding as well. So I think understanding better how secondary market works and how rea investors react to the secondary market's existence is a very important thing for many of us to look into. Okay. So, uh, so those are the three uh, things that I want to highlight. And uh, there are other stuff that I don't want to go into, but that's there. So, <laughs> okay. so those are what, what I call something borrowed, borrowed because it was in crowdfunding uh, for loans. Um, but there's also, more importantly for this conference, I think, is something new in, 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 in the sense that how we can use something uh, that we gather, something that we found in, uh, reward, uh, in the P2P lending market to inform uh, what happens in uh, equity crowdfunding, real estate crowdfunding, and so on. So I think there is, um, these are really new phenomena. I think it's really interesting that people actually, we can actually do a lot of things with equity and real estate and so on. So it's a lot of exciting developments, I think particularly in, in, in Germany here. And also in the US, I think there has been some growth in the uh, real estate crowdfunding market as well. Uh, equity crowdfunding obviously after the Jobs Act has been uh, uh, picking up as well. Uh, so, but. I don't think the findings that we have from the peer to peer lending will completely apply to these new markets for uh, several reasons. Uh, one is that, so I have been collecting data on rewards crowdfunding, such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and also equity crowdfunding, uh, such as uh, some of the platforms in the UK as well. But the challenge that I always found, because I'm, as academics, we have to write papers for the reviewers first, right? So, um, so for us, I think at least the, the most challenging thing is the fact that there's a whole lot of arts element in rewards crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, and even real estate crowdfunding. I call them arts because every single project is different. So for that crowdfunding, is a little bit easier because loans are loans. You can package them. At the end of the day, it's just a bunch of numbers, and uh, it's almost like something you can package. But for, this is a, just a screenshot I took from uh, Crowdcube yesterday. You can see how varied they are. They go into all different kind of industries and so on. So if you really want to do a project level analysis to convince reviewers that one of them is a counterfactual of another, that is very, very difficult to do. You can control for a lot of things about each project, uh, the funders and so on. It's, I think it's, uh, objectively speaking, it's very, very hard to find something that's truly a counterfactual of each other. So that creates a lot of problem for, for instance, uh, the, the causal inference that we're trying to make for academic researchers. So, so that's at least one thing that I think is um, a challenge if we want to um, general, generalize some of the findings from uh, P2P lending to this new context. Okay. Uh, so this is one. And for real estate, real estate, I think, is probably even more challenging because every house is different. right? So that this is even going to be even more interesting. There's a lot of numbers, but how we use the numbers to actually make causal inferences, that's going to be uh, very interesting and worthy of research, obviously. Um, the second one is um, the use for 
not just for loans, but also for other types, types of crowdfunding, there is a lot of uh, work on predictions as well. So for instance, you can use uh, prediction to detect fraud activities and so on. And there are also um, uh, algorithm tra trading that has been developed for peer-to-peer -peer lending. And uh, I'm sure that as the scale develops, there's going to be similar developments for, um, reward, uh, for equity crowdfunding and even real estate crowdfunding. So the use of algorithms and uh, machine learning in this field, I think, is going to be opening up a whole lot of um, opportunities. But on the other hand, as we all know, there could be potentials for biases, right? So for instance, I think just the, what we saw in the news, when you use a machine to train uh, data on how to hire people, that will translate into the bias that you don't want to have in the hiring process. So um, this is actually from a, a long time ago when uh, Lending Club was, uh, I think it was, I think it's the second iteration of Lending Club when they're trying to create a match between borrowers and lenders, which was very interesting, but they also have a, what they call the secret sauce, how to connect the borrowers and lenders to each other. So, so algorithm is actually not, not, not something new, but actually been going on for, for a long time. But on the other hand, I think there still needs to be a lot of research on how these algorithms or the predictions affect the market participants and also the com competition environment in this different context. I think that would be a very important thing for us all to think about. Uh, so well, obviously, for instance, in loans, um, you could use a lot, like in some of my work, we look at text, right? So how people write when they are requesting funding. Uh, it may seem very innocuous that you are just trying to predict whether somebody is going to default or not. But the, by writing itself, sometimes could reflect some, like reflect some of the protective information. For instance, whether uh, the gender, the race, they all could have a bearing on how you write. So if you develop an algorithm to, uh, to predict somebody's default likelihood based on what they write, how is that going to play into the fact that you need to make sure that your lending is done fairly and not violating any of the, any of the red lines? So I think it's not a very obvious question. There's always a big trade-off between uh, the, the avoiding discrimination versus achieving the market efficiency that we have to auto think about. And, and I don't think that's unique to uh, debt crowdfunding, but also applies to other kind of crowdfunding markets as well. Okay. So this is my last slide. And uh, with a lot of challenges, I think there are still uh, some uh, we are here because of the challenges, right? We are, if, if there are no challenges there, there's no need for us to do researches. So, but I think that the more important thing is actually how we can proceed. So I think these are three from my uh, limited experience. I think these are some of the things that are uh, very helpful. One is the uh, discussion and the collaboration between different stakeholders in the, in, the, in the market. So I think this conference is precisely a very good representation of that kind of effort. The second one is the interdisciplinary research. Um, I'm very lucky to be in the field of information systems. So this is a relatively small field, but I get to work on whatever that I like to do, and I can reach out to different uh, experts in different fields. So I have collaborated in, I think, almost all dif uh, disciplines in the business school. So, so it's, it's very, very, I think it's also very helpful, like even statistics and so on. You can use different uh, angles to look at the same phenomenon. So even for P2P lending data, I think these days have been looked at by computer scientists, statisticians, and so on. So I think it's, we, once we have the data, it's very easy to have an uh, interdisciplinary approach to tackle the problems together. And then the last one, of course, is probably um, more difficult, just like what I mentioned before. We always have to balance between the need to protect and also the need to experiment. So this is not very easy to do, but I think it's ultimately uh, how much do we want to e uh, experiment and how much we want to protect the person, the people that who need to be protected, such as smaller investors. So um, again, that's what just my uh, something that I wanted to share with you guys based on what I've, what I've done in the peer-to-peer -peer lending market, and I hope that some of them will be useful for uh, newer uh, iterations of fintech innovations, such as real estate crowdfunding. Okay, all right. Thank you all very much.